What I'm going to talk to you about is um, the findings of a research project that's been undertaken within the last 12 months, uh, generously supported by Dairy Australia, the Cotton Research and Development Corporation and grain growers, looking at the implications of digital agriculture and by inference big data uh, for agriculture in Australia. So um, it, it basically involved an analysis of a lot of the issues and also a fairly close examination of some relevant case studies and I think that's quite important. Um, so digital agriculture is a term we've used um, basically to describe agriculture which relies on detailed digital information about a wide range of production variables which are utilised as a guide to production decisions. And we're making sure we understand that that's different from so-called big data because big data is data whose scale, diversity and complexity requires new architecture, techniques, algorithms and analysis to manage it and extract value. Um, the two are obviously related because you've got to have digital agriculture, if you like, as part of the collection process of the raw material that becomes part and parcel of big data. Um, so just to describe it, uh, digital agriculture might be the use of five years of yield maps from a specific paddock by an agronomist to develop a variable rate planting and fertiliser strategy, whereas big data would be something like the analysis of all the yield maps from all the grain harvesters operating in Australia over a five year period, together with weather data to identify yield and water use efficiency trends. So um, differences of scale, and I guess um, digital agriculture is more about um, individuals and management decisions. To just give you an example, and many of you will know this, um, if we think about it in this term, uh, one year's yield map from a particular paddock uh, is of pretty limited value. Um, five to ten years yield map in combination with an understanding of the rainfall conditions in each of those years starts to give you something you can uh, actually make some use out of to make future decisions. And then if you had yield maps for an entire country, um, obviously uh, coupled with things like soil data and uh, meteorological data, you can learn an enormous amount about a whole range of different variables. So um, one of the quandaries of this whole area is that um, uh, by, by themselves, and I guess the other speakers have mentioned this, small pieces of data don't actually generate much value. Um, it's only when they're combined together in the right systems and in the right um, uh, volume that you actually start to get some value out of them. What's, what is that value? I guess that's the other point that certainly a lot of farmers would say, well, OK, I've had a header with uh, yield maps for the last decade. I'm still not sure I'm getting any value out of it. Or I've, I've got a, a spray coop that I can do all sorts of things with and vary the rate and do uh, marvellous stuff, but I'm not really generating much value out of that. Um, I guess the experience uh, of the developments that have occurred in the Corn Belt in the USA where the concepts and the, the practicalities of utilising much more intensive information systems to make production decisions gives us a bit of an example. So um, um, the sort of numbers that, that, that come out of the sort of analysis that's been done uh, in a whole range of scenarios um, are around about that 5 to 10 per cent productivity gain. So, so by moving from um, paddock average to square metre average management or moving from herd or flock average to individual animal management, um, that tends to be the gain able to be achieved uh, by these systems. And obviously then that's uh, uh, offset, if you like, by the price of the system. So uh, depending on the platform you're using, um, that would, would determine what the net value is. But certainly the platforms that are being used in the Corn Belt in the USA, the more sophisticated ones are charging in that region of 3 to $10 an acre, and even at that level um, are generating quite significant returns um, uh, from, from the use of that. So um, I think, and, and it's interesting that when you look at some of the examples in the livestock industries as well, that 5 to 10% figure is um, the sort of figure that gets talked about. So certainly, depending on the cost of the system, obviously, there is some value in, uh, in pursuing them. I think the other thing to... Uh, to get in our minds is um, we're, we're moving through a transition. So if you think about agriculture, and certainly uh, 50 years ago, it was a skills-based industry. Um, it was the skills of the manager 
and the skills of the observations of that manager that determined uh, the success or otherwise of the business. We've slowly transitioned to a situation now, if you think of uh, reliance on data in yellow and reliance on skills in blue, we've started to transition to a situation where some of the sectors are now starting to be more information based uh, compared to what they were. So if we look at variable rate cropping systems, we've moved from a uh, purely skills decision where the, the manager looked at the scenarios and decided what he was going to plant to one where you're starting to see um, the greater use and integration of data as part of the management system. At the other end of the spectrum, if you like, is perhaps the broiler poultry industry where now in Australia if you decide to um, have a broiler poultry set up on your property, you can parachute in the technology and all the control systems and basically end up watching uh, weight gain of the, uh, of the birds involved on a computer screen that controls all the inputs as well. So um, what, what we're talking about is this sort of gradual transition of agriculture from a purely skills and observation based uh, um, enterprise to, to one which increasingly integrate, integrates um, uh, digital information into the system and, and helps uh, that is used to make production decisions. And obviously the ultimate objective of a lot of these systems, particularly in, a, in an intensive cropping system like the US, is to be able to integrate all the various elements of information from yield maps and rainfall and temperature and soil type, etc., cetera, uh, through a platform, utilising uh, an algorithm and to come up with an optimum solution for something like, well, well what, what variable rate, what variety should I use, what fertiliser application should I use to sow the next crop. So that's the sort of um, 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 the holy grail, if you like. And I think Alex has already mentioned uh, an, an, a critical element and a critical competitive element in these is the um, algorithm, the numbers, the, the, the formula, if you like, that's used to convert all that uh, variable information into something that's actually actionable uh, from a management decision perspective. Um, and, and I think we'll see that when we look at the example of the US systems, that um, a lot of the participants have quickly realised that that's where the competitive advantage lies. If you can get that uh, algorithm uh, for your system to work better than the algorithm for another system. The other uh, interesting development is, is how these systems have progressed, particularly in things like the cropping industry. So uh, they started off with, with an implement like a tractor it became a smart product. It started to incorporate sensors around machine data and those sorts of things. It then became smart and connected uh, through connections with things like GPS and uh, uh, mobile communications technology. It then started to become a product system. So your tractor talked to your um, um, implement and there was a feedback system. In fact, I had an interesting example of that uh, on my own um, family's operation at Christmas time where uh, just prior to going away for a couple of days holiday, um, my brothers wanted to feed um, some cattle and they had a brand new uh, silage feed trailer and we spent three hours convincing the tractor that there was a silage feed trailer behind it because the only way he could get the feeder to work was from the console in the tractor. So um, that's a sort of a, if you like, a, um, um, a connected or product system. And then what we're moving towards and what has also been developed is a system of systems. So um, the machinery system talks to um, the irrigation system, talks to the um, um, uh, uh, weather systems, uh, to the financial data. So you've got um, an integration across all those different platforms and, and, and the ability to transfer information between them in a fairly seamless fashion. So that's uh, where things are quickly heading to. So if we look at um, developments that have occurred uh, around things like the Corn Belt, um, we've seen very quickly emerge uh, quite a competitive market for the provision of uh, digital information platforms and systems. Um, if, if you look at the matrix, um, you've got the makers of precision agricultural equipment, um, the names that would be familiar there, some making the machinery, some making the control modules for them. Um, and, and so they're the ones who are generating and capturing the data, if you like. Some of those are also just involved in providing storage and retrieval systems for that data. And then some of them are also uh, involved in then utilising some of that data and the insights of that data 
back in as a delivery system to um, the next uh, iteration of those decisions, if you like. Uh, some are just involved in providing cloud storage and data warehouses, so they're not really, and, and you'll see some familiar names there like uh, Amazon and, and some of those. So they're basically acting as a, um, a, a, a cheap storage facility but not doing much else. Um, a lot of the drive has been from retailers, so these are the um, fertiliser and chemical retailers that are supplying product to um, the clients on the ground. Um, and SST is a very strong um, uh, software product that allows the uh, retail agronomist to come onto the farm to map out the um, proposed uh, cropping regime to then uh, estimate the fertiliser seed and the variety requirements, push a button, the order goes back to head office, all the paperwork's done and, and the retail agronomist moves on to the next farm. So uh, the platforms that have been developed um, have a whole pile of benefits, but the driver for it has been how do we automate this system and use um, the retail agronomist time more efficiently. Um, and so they, they're the sort of platforms that have developed. And then there's a limited development of smart models. And, and a lot of these depend on um, the development of those algorithms. So the, the organisations there um, need to have um, much more comprehensive sets of data available, not just for example, the weather, or not just some variety results from particular corn uh, types or those sorts of things. They need to be able to put all those, to, all those together um, to create these platforms. Um, the, the uptake of the use of these systems um, has been quite dramatic. Um, as I said, some of it driven by um, the fact that it solves a problem for the retailer, um, some of it driven by the fact that um, for individual corn farmers who might have multiple plots of land, it's a way of putting all that information together in one accessible bit. And it's interesting, when, when the first um, very um, deterministic models came out, um, things like field scripts, which was released by Monsanto, um, the, the leading edge farmers didn't need a computer to tell them how to make good management decisions. They were of the view that they could outperform any algorithm in, in an iPad. Um, but the point was made by the providers of these that in fact, um, as, as some of them described it to me, it was the lazy middle that became the target market. So the lazy middle weren't the leading edge farmers. They knew they could be better. They knew they should be spending more time refining their management and upskilling. But this provided an easy platform for them uh, to, to avoid having to put that effort in, but at the same time to gain some productivity benefits. So a lot of the users of these types of systems, um, often under the guidance of their agronomist, are in fact uh, what some of the retailers would consider not the leading edge farmers, but those who come a little bit behind them. So what are some of the products available? Probably the one that's uh, garnered most attention is uh, the Climate Corporation products. Uh, they're now released under the Field View label. Um, those of you familiar with the history of Climate Corporation might know that it was started by um, some ex-Google employees who recognised the intrinsic value in the massive accumulated weather data from the US, which is a very high density um, uh, data information collected over 100 years. They realised that um, being able to dive into that and become much more specific about weather risks was a major advantage for insurers and they would sell that service to insurers. Uh, Monsanto came along with uh, its masses of variety data from, from corn variety and soy uh, breeding in uh, the US, put those together with uh, the very detailed soil maps that are also publicly available in the US and started to come up with um, platforms that uh, take away or, or simply simplify a lot of the management decisions. One of the most uh, striking ones was what they call the nitrogen advisor. So uh, once all that work's been done, once that mapping's been done and the information's available, um, one of the key questions for a corn farmer in the US is how much nitrogen to apply and when. And this tool created quite uh, simple predictive models based on all that information behind um, to help make that decision. In the first year this uh, particular product was released, it was used on 70 million acres in one year. Um, so I think there's some interesting lessons there in that it solved a simple problem. It didn't try and manage the whole farm. Um, and so the use and uptake of it 
was, was accelerated by the retail agronomists providing that product and helping farmers get used to it and then the fact that it solved a simple problem, not the whole, not running of the whole farm. Uh, another interesting example is the FarmLink product. Um, FarmLink started life as a leasing company pr providing finance for contract harvesters. They realised that all those contract harvesters that they financed were all generating yield maps. They developed some technology to do two things. One, standardise the calibration of those yield maps and secondly, transmit that yield map information from the harvester to, to a, a, a single storage site. They then were able to combine that information with the soil maps again, with the detailed uh, rainfall data available in the US, and develop up uh, what's essentially amounts to a benchmarking service. So in other words, it allows um, a comparison of the performance of the yield on a particular field with a very similar yield, some, uh, very similar field somewhere else. So they sold that service to the agronomists who were then able to sit down with their clients and say, well, look, here's how we compared with um, these other fields that were harvested that were very similar conditions. Um, maybe we should have done this different or that different. Then the secondary uh, outcome of that was they realised that, in fact, these yield maps were um, a, a very useful calibration for satellite imagery. So they knew the actual yield, they had the satellite imagery, they could therefore calibrate the satellite imagery for that particular field and then extrapolate that calibration out to all the other fields that they weren't um, actually harvesting. So uh, they believe that that's given them a very low cost and highly accurate uh, ability to predict crop uh, outcomes. Um, and, and in fact, they believe it'll uh, produce a better result than, uh, than the USDA is able to once it's developed a bit more. So that, I guess, is, is some uh, sense of the sort of developments that are occurring in the US. Of course, the My John Deere platform, some of you may be familiar with. Um, most uh, of the high-end John Deere equipment now comes out with the ability to transmit in real time uh, to the My John Deere platform. Um, one, of, one of the things that's developed, uh, a lot of these services were what you might call loyalty plays. So in other words, if you bought a, uh, a blue coloured tractor, uh, your data was specific to the blue coloured tractor and the longer you kept retaining that data, the more you were more or less committed to that blue, blue coloured tractor because uh, to move away from that particular variety of tractor would mean that you no longer had access to that data. That quite quickly changed. Um, it's, it's considered two reasons. One, um, the uh, providers of those platforms realised that it was uh, creating a real problem for them in that they would have to be able to manage uh, the requirements and expectations of their entire customer base. And so they would have to develop more and more complicated software products if they were going to retain that information, that digital information, as proprietary to their system. Um, so what happened was um, the, the development of, um, yes, Climate Corp are involved in the development of this platform. Uh, they also can use it in conjunction with um, Precision Planting, which happens to be owned by Monsanto and the Monsanto Seed Group, but they've also created an opportunity for the Ag Gateway and the Open Ag Data Alliance compliance systems to actually store their data on that and Case IH to store their data on that and then you can have multiple users out the other end and all using uh, proprietary or competing software but all interoperable so that one bit of data residing on that platform can go to multiple different uses. So I guess the analogy is the Apple iOS system where um, Apple maintains the iOS platform but you can have a very competitive market for applications and software all that can use that platform. So that's what's fairly quickly happened in terms of the developments in the US. And there's a very competitive market developed amongst software providers for um, the different sorts of systems that farmers might want. So as I said, it was initially a product loyalty platform for big players, now foresee a major new revenue source by providing um, a service that also has the open access arrangements for other users. The system costs for, uh, the, the high end system costs for US farmers are in the region of three to $10 per acre. And companies like John Deere express the view that they see it as a way of smoothing out what is a very uh, seasonal uh, revenue flow for that company, that by providing an ongoing data maintenance and management service, um, they're creating another source of revenue that helps them to smooth out their cash flow. Um, the, the lessons from uh, the development of these systems is that um, uh, 
ways to reduce costs are a much easier sell to farmer than the promise of increased yield. Uh, I guess intrinsically we probably all recognise that uh, as, as, as a logical thing, that, that if you can show a farmer a way to use these tools to reduce costs, um, it's a lot easier sell than promising them that they'll be able to increase their yield. And the other point about a lot of these uh, is that the main delivery model is via crop advisors. So it's not farmers themselves sitting down and going through the detailed process of establishing the maps and inputting all the information. It's actually their advisors uh, using uh, the platform to put the farmer's information in and then allow the farmer to use that once it's set up. So I think that's quite an important lesson in terms of the adoption of these sort of systems that um, um, it, it's not likely that uh, there'll be a mass rush of farmers to uh, buy these products and, and put all their farm data for the last 10 years on it, that in fact often it's facilitated by uh, advisors. Data ownership and security. Um, most US vendors are now starting to uh, adhere to the Data Gateway or Open Ag Data Alliance standards and encourage uh, application software developers. So, so that doesn't mean all the data is in a standardised format. It just means that anyone who wants to develop a software product to work on a particular set of data can obtain the metadata that explains the structure of the data that they're working with. So it basically means that you can transfer data from, from one platform to another. So if you get sick of blue tractors and decide you want to go to yellow, uh, then you can translate uh, your data across to the new platform when you change products. So that's quite an important um, uh, development. Most guarantee data confidentiality. Um, uh, it, there's some exceptions to that. For example, John Deere retains the right to machine data. So in other words, the performance of the uh, engine and, and, and temperature and running and those sorts of things um, and, and, and believes that's proprietary to them and allows farmers to set access rights to production data. So you can store your production data on the JD platform but you can say what uses that data can be put to, um, and, and there's a range of those. Um, Monsanto Climate Corp ensure the data remains secure and is not provided to third parties. So again, they've recognised that for farmers to be confident and to use these systems, you have to provide that assurance around data and recognition of data ownership. Um, all that said, of course, uh, in the event of uh, a legal uh, situation, any of this data is accessible under subpoena and that's no different to the situation of a, a farm notebook or a, a paddock record of some sort. There's no change there. So um, the, the ultimate level of security um, in the case of a, a, a legal case, for example, is, is no different to anything else. Um, so that certainly needs to be kept in mind. So can these systems are developing quite quickly in the US and, and becoming uh, utilised and uptake is quite um, strong. Will, will we sort of see these sort of sin things in Australia? Uh, I think it's important to realise the US systems are developed on a few things that we don't have. So very high density rainfall and climate data, both weather stations and Doppler radar that gives very localised rainfall, not uh, rainfall extrapolated between two points 100 kilometres apart. Um, so I think that's quite important. Um, very high resolution national soil maps. So that one to 25,000 national soil map is, is, is readily available and accessible to anyone in the US. So a lot of these systems use that, even though they recognise that that's not highly accurate, but at least gets them in the ballpark of understanding what the, the situation is. Extensive public GPS and mobile phone network and GPS correction systems. So uh, right across the Corn Belt, certainly, um, that is, is a given, so that that sort of um, uh, accessibility is already there. And also we need to remember that in fact the system has been developed off a, a monoculture high input crop, so very high inputs, which brings with it the ability to be more efficient and a single crop focus, so you've got a very lot of uh, research gone into the performance of a single crop, which makes uh, uh, predictions and algorithms a bit more uh, stable than, uh, than where there's been less intense research. Um, but also importantly, a large and competitive US market for software applications, so agri-tech as they call it. Um, so there's a whole investment uh, 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 population um, floating and, and trying out and developing um, uh, software applications for agri-data. Uh, so not 
public research institutions, but actually commercial providers um, funded by venture capitalists and, and developing these platforms. And I think that's been quite uh, a major, and so when you go to a, a conference on AgriData in the US, you might have a couple of hundred vendors there all displaying their wares and um, uh, showing how competitive the situation is. So that's uh, quite important as well. Um, it just gives you an example of some of the soil data that's available. So what's, what are we likely to see in Australia? Um, I think the Australian uh, cropping industry will be a recipient of the technology spill-ins from the US, and we're already seeing that. The, um, a couple of the major retailers use the SST software platform, uh, which is used by their retail agronomists, and you can see that there's already been uh, the use of that in fairly extensive areas throughout the cropping belt. So um, the, the sort of uh, stuff we're talking about is already here, but predominantly being used by retailers as a, a way of managing um, the sourcing and supplying of inputs. Um, there's no developments in the US in terms of systems incorporating livestock and crop rotations, and Alex touched on this earlier. I think that's the big difference and that's the big challenge for Australia, that um, the real value, particularly in the southern systems, will be the ability to integrate information about livestock enterprises and cropping enterprises on the one sort of platform. And uh, there's none of that sort of development obvious in the US. Um, and there's virtually no development of off-the-shelf livestock systems in the US. Most of the systems are, in fact, proprietary systems that operate in the big feed yards or the big piggery or poultry or dairy operations where they develop their own system. But there's not really um, those um, sort of commercial off-the-shelf type systems being used in the livestock systems there. Uh, the relevant algorithms for probabilistic decision support in Australian crops will need further development. There is some already and of course all on the back of the APSIM model developed by the CSRO some time ago and further developed and we've got production wise being uh, operated by grain growers and things like yield profit etc providing a basis. So we're, we've started down the track, um, certainly we're not uh, anywhere near to the development that the US corn industry is at the moment, but uh, there's, there's progress being made. So what would it take to facilitate the development of these sort of systems in Australia? I guess the big challenge is, is it feasible to uh, improve the uh, knowledge of soil types by, for example, improving the quality of soil testing and, and to aggregate that information together? That would obviously require uh, private individuals to allow their soil test data to be aggregated and, and used in some of these big applications. I mean, that may be one way to get around the sort of um, limitation we have in terms of the specifics of soil data available in the US. Um, uh, farmers and industry should probably develop and commit to open access data standards and privacy products because that's how you're going to uh, encourage a competitive software market. Um, farmers certainly don't want to be locked into proprietary systems. They want to be confident that if they do go down the track of investing in these sort of systems that um, they will be able to uh, be uh, choosy about their future suppliers and, and, and that's certainly something that seems to have helped in terms of the development of these sort of products in the US. Um, farmer ownership of data and control over use requires agreement. So. Um, this isn't something that's legislated in the US. In fact, in both the US and New Zealand, um, the industry collectively, farmers, software developers, uh, technology providers have all come together and negotiated um, a, a standard agreement about uh, the nature of ownership and use of the data. And that certainly seems to have created a degree more confidence in the application of these. Is it feasible to incentivise private weather data systems to supplement the existing BOM system? Um, Oz Forecast, based up at Narrabri, is already doing that. So you can uh, buy a fully automated, highly precise weather station for around about $5,000, install it, it gets integrated into the system, and then you can retrieve information uh, from the web that includes both the BOM stations and private stations and get much more accurate weather data relevant to your particular crop. As, as, as uh, uh, someone said to me, uh, uh, this extrapolated rainfall for, uh, between two points 100 kilometres apart is all right for virtual models, but it's not much good for growing a real crop. Um, having that uh, much more localised uh, weather data is quite important to uh, have these systems working well. So I think there is some feasibility of um, filling in the gaps, if you like, with that um, private weather data system. And uh, this is a point Alex made and others have made as well. 
The other algorithm development needs data analysts, not plant or animal scientists. In fact, Climate Corp told me last year they put on about 90 data analysts and one plant physiologist. Um, so it's, it's, it's not that we don't understand the systems, it's just that there's a lot of work involved in getting all that data integrated and put together in a way that uh, creates a useful product out the other end. Um, so what are the issues? Uh, clarity regarding uh, data ownership and control over use is cer certainly something we need. Uh, cropping and livestock digital systems, both private and government, I think need to be open access so that, for example, NLIS can be tapped into by the, by the developers of, uh, for example, livestock systems and integrated. So you don't have to have, um, here's your livestock management platform that you're using on the farm. And oh, by the way, when you're selling cattle, you've got to move to a different system um, to generate your national vendor declaration and, and, and upload the data around uh, the, the livestock tag. So, so having a single system rather than um, uh, multiple systems would obviously be appealing, but that requires um, open access data. Um, and that should apply to research as well, because um, a lot of the um, uh, gains that have been made in the US have been based on the ability to look at very large uh, um, uh, stores of uh, data from research trials and to use that to develop some of the algorithms. Um, so USDA at the moment is starting to move towards having all its internal research trial data uh, transferred to an open access system. And I think um, that needs to be thought about seriously here in Australia because a lot of the IP restrictions that are placed on them uh, never eventually generate any revenue. So um, you wonder whether in fact we'd be better off uh, with an approach that basically said that uh, data is accessible to anyone who wants to play around with it and to try and come up with new products or new services that could be based on it. Um, and I think the final thing that's probably needed in Australia is in fact a forum or a, uh, a way of bringing the various diff different parties together. So you've got data analysts, some computer specialists, software developers, researchers, um, uh, farm retailers and suppliers, uh, and farmers themselves, all have got an interest in this area but have no common meeting point. So I think there's um, some quite um, uh, merit in thinking about how do you bring all those various groups together and get that interaction that invariably ends up um, bringing together or, or bringing forward some of these uh, new developments. And I think ultimately the dilemma is this, that the more Australian farmers collect and freely share production data, the more likely it is that digital agriculture will de deliver productivity gains, but that's in the future. So um, getting the, the, the right frameworks and the right thinking around this is important now so that uh, by the time some of these developments occur, the data is accessible and able to be used and, and provides use and generates those productivity gains. Um, a quick ad, we've got a conference coming up uh, to discuss these issues in much more detail 2nd or 3rd of June in Sydney and uh, as always the Institute is generously supported by a wealth of industry organisations and we always like to acknowledge them. So thank you. <laughs>